Well, hey everybody, and welcome to the first inaugural episode of what we are calling Tin Tin Forever. Um, I am PG Holyfield. I uh, started a little website a few years ago called uh, specficmedia.com. I've got a couple podcasts that go on there, or YouTube shows, uh, one for Beyond the Wall, which is for uh, the Game of Thrones television show, uh, where we talk or we meet weekly and do an episode about that during the season of Game of Thrones. Uh, in between seasons, we started doing a media-related podcast YouTube show called uh, specficmedia.com Presents Consumption, and uh, we talk about movies and books and television and what have you on that on a weekly basis, uh, but we're going to do something a little bit different with this, uh, I have been a fan of the Tintin comic books, uh, comic albums, uh, ever since I was a kid. A few, um, I guess it was a couple years ago, I met, um, or I had already met, but, but during a meeting with uh, Valerie Durham, who is the uh, better half of a uh, friend, podcaster, writer James Durham, uh, found out that she was a fan of Tintin as well, and took a took a year or two to f actually get uh, uh, get the uh, get this started. But uh, what we want to do with this show uh, really it probably be, take a couple years because we're going to do a monthly podcast where we uh, talk about um, the Tintin books. There are twenty three uh, Tintin comic albums, uh, what would be called graphic novels today. Um, yes, as Valerie is showing there, we have <laughs> the, the, she has the same versions I did, which we'll talk a little bit about our, our history, our respective histories with uh, reading Tintin. Uh, but we'll, we'll do an episode uh, on each book, and then we will also... You know, in between, if we get uh, the urge, we'll do things like maybe a special episode on uh, Tintin the the movie, the the animated Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, maybe some of maybe have some fun with the uh, there was a television series uh, back in the early '90s uh, that in America was uh, shown on HBO, and um, there were some European movies in the. I guess there was one in like 1947, which never really got the light of day. Um, there were a few in the in the 60s, I believe, and then a couple in the early 70s that very European. And uh, from what I've seen, that you can find most of them, most of them on YouTube. So we'll have some fun with that. Um, in addition, we'll we'll you know if we if we have uh, time, you know, we'll send Valerie to to. London to go uh, <laughs> be our correspondent. So there. <laughs> or go to go to Brussels and uh, visit the the Hergé Museum. Musée uh, Hergé, yeah. yeah. But um, I did want to uh, introduce Valerie. Valerie, hi. How are you? Hello, PG and Tintinologists all over the world. Yes, uh, I, I actually want to say up front before you before you talk a little bit about yourself is that um, there are probably ninety five percent of the people out there that know Tintin know more about Tintin than I do. I and me as well. <laughs> I I am a fan. There's still a couple of the uh, books that I haven't read yet, just because I didn't have them as a kid. Um, because they, they were, um, um, well, there's a couple that he did during his, his early years that were, uh, not released, uh, mm -hmm. in a lot like, well, Tintin in the Land of the Soviets wasn't released pretty much right. at all until the 70s, and then Tintin in the Congo was, wasn't very easy to find because it was, right. um, it was, it, yeah, it was controversial, um, you know, the political, politically correct climate of today. It would be considered racially insensitive. At that time, it was more about, um, um, it was about the Belgian Congo, which 
the reason they did the book was because they wanted to represent a, a viewpoint of we have to take care of this country and, as their protectors and so that it was very patronizing and, and, and that sort of thing but it, 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 it definitely pieces of it come across as, as racially insensitive if, if you know if, if nothing else definitely. but um, but it was more a pure uh, a testament of the time more than uh, there's certainly people in in recent times especially but right before the movie came out there were protests the idea of of Hergé the artist being being racially insensitive or a racist which was uh, you know by all accounts and everybody that that wrote about him and knew him uh, said that was not the case um, but I didn't have any uh, knowledge of, of of that part of things um, my 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 experience with him was was more just you know all the ones from the 40s on uh, which you know were basically Indiana Jones type type uh, stories but we'll talk a little bit more about that here I am yapping too much Valerie <laughs> so much <laughs> tell to talk everybody about. <laughs> tell everybody about yourself okay great I'm Valerie Durham and uh, my kind of career path actually takes me to dance. I'm an Isadora Duncan dancer by profession. Um, I've danced since I was three years old and uh, have been doing Duncan dance for the past 20 years. And I have a company and a school. And um, that's kind of what I do with my time. But uh, I do, I do Duncan donuts. Does that count for anything? <laughs> they go very well together. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, but growing up, um, I was able to travel quite a bit. My parents uh, are writers, and so we lived in the Bahamas. Um, we lived in London, and it was when uh, I was living in London that we discovered the Tintin books as a family, um, albums as they call them. Of course, we didn't know that at the time. But if you can imagine, there were, f I guess, six of us living in a one-bedroom flat in St. John's Wood, um, London. And so we didn't spend a lot of time um, in the flat. We would kind of try to get out to the beautiful parks. We were right next to Regent's Park, right down the street from Baker Street, uh, the famous home of Sherlock Holmes. And up the other direction was the little local library. And we went in there and discovered these wonderful comic books. And what was so great about them is that they appealed kind of universally um, to both my sisters and my brothers and myself. And we would spend many a cozy hour at the end of a long day of sightseeing around London or going to West End shows. We would come back to the flat, cozy up in the living room, and this was my favorite, having Cadbury hot chocolate with toasted butter and Irish, uh, toasted bread and Irish butter uh, as, I'm, and as I'm munching away and sipping away, reading all of Tintin and Captain Haddock's amazing adventures all over the world. Wow. Uh, yeah, this was, it was, so I kind of feel like maybe I should be eating buttered toast and having cocoa during our broadcast here. Yeah, we here. can do that. We can, uh, yeah. we can plan on doing that. Don't we'll worry. start a, a major event here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also, like PG, you know, really wasn't aware of kind of the more political overtones of the comic as I was reading them. Also for me, it was really just kind of, it kind of embraced what I was experiencing as we're traveling around Europe and into Russia and some into South America. I felt a little bit of a connection with Tintin beyond the wonderful adventures because he was going to places where some of the places I and mean, he went way more places than I than we went as a family but uh, I felt this cosmopolitan aspect of it and I really connected with that and I think also because I was living in the in London when I discovered Tintin I never thought of him as a Belgian reporter. I never thought of him as living in Brussels. Maybe it's because I was reading the English version and they had mm -hmm. quids and, you know, everything was very, even the phone booths and everything seemed very British to me. So I always thought he was an English reporter living in London and that Marlon Spy Call was out in the country yeah. somewhere in England. And that, you know, later when I discovered he was Belgian, really, uh, that was kind of a surprise to me. But still read them, read them to my son, all my brothers and sisters read them. It is a source of great joy in my family and, and in our lives. Yeah, I was, uh, I was exactly the same way um, as far as interpreting the stories as, as Tintin being a British lad. Yeah. Um, 
which didn't make sense because uh, the way I came to it was a little bit different. I was not a world traveler as, as your family uh, has been. I need to learn more about that. But um, I, my aunt, um, she worked for the Department of Agriculture and why they had a Department of Agriculture office in foreign countries, I don't know, but they did. And she, so she spent uh, over 20 years in places like uh, London and uh, Brussels and Moscow uh, wow. and Paris, um, uh, working in the, the um, American embassy in those, uh, in those locations. So she would bring back, um, she started bringing back, you know, the, the Tintin comics and you, you had yours. I, I, mine are mostly up there, but you know, this is, this is, yeah. here's one of them that, Looks uh, like that she brought back. This is, this is my favorite, um, overall, I think Tintin in Tibet, but, um, yeah, she started bringing them back and then I, you know, they were just like two or three and they were just scattered you know one was you know probably from the 40s and one was from the 60s and you know had no idea what the the timeline or anything and um, it didn't put together that you know that he was a a, a belgian reporter just like just like yeah. you said valerie because it you know like you said marlon spike hall and captain right. haddock seems very british and right. He's drinking you know scottish whiskey i mean <laughs> exactly so you know the 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 um, translations into the different languages they did yeah. more than just translate yeah. you know the words they did a lot of things that that, that sort of made I, I think made them more worldly and right. uh, appeal to the audiences that they were they were being uh, translated for uh, more than just you know having them be a, a Belgian you know, reporter, which wouldn't have bothered me at all. I had nothing uh, for <laughs> against, the Belgian, against reporters. Belgium, but <laughs> I mean, my my aunt lived there for for three or four years, so uh, never got to visit there, but uh, definitely had uh, heard good stories about Brussels, especially. Mm. Um, so she started bringing those back when she'd come to visit, and that's all I ever wanted was you know I'd wait for her. She'd come back once a year for for a week or two, and then you know go back and then she'd always bring me a couple and we always kept a list of what I had and what oh, I didn't yeah. have so that, uh -huh. you know, so I could, she could fill in. Uh -huh. Yeah, so she could be on the lookout and uh, this was in the late 70s and, uh, uh, you know, up until probably 82, 83 probably was uh, when I got the last ones that I got when I was, you know, a teenager. And just, yeah, I read them over and over again, just like you were saying, they were just a comfort yeah. to me in a lot of ways, you know, because they were, they were, I mean, Tintin, and for those that may be watching this that have not read Tintin, Tintin, as we said, is a, uh, a reporter, although they really don't, he doesn't boy do a lot reporter. of reporting. <laughs> the boy reporter, uh, he never really ages, nope. um, you know, they've, at one point during an interview, he's, you know, earlier when, when age was probably, you know, he could get away with this, he said that he was probably around 17, right. and you're like, okay, a 17-year-old traveling and drink, you know, he didn't drink all that much compared to Captain Haddock, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, most of the time he would uh, turn it down, I think, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but he was sort of the uh, eternal Boy Scout. Yeah. Um, and he was also almost like a blank page. He, he wasn't real emotional he didn't you know he didn't fall in love on these adventures yeah. he didn't uh you know he he got in a lot of fights but it, he wasn't a a an angry person or you know he, yeah that was all captain haddock's or yeah <laughs> captain haddock's job and snowy's job to be the emotional right. uh uh you know characters mm -hmm. in the stories but but he represented just uh you know an adventurous spirit and and you know growing up and whether you know, like you said, it, it appealed to to you. You know, whether you were your sisters or your brothers, you, you, it appeals to everybody. Right. And um, one of the things they always say about the Tintin books is that it appeals to, or Hergé said that it, you know it appeals to everyone from seven to seventy-seven, and um, that really is the case because you get a lot out of reading the story as a child, just mm -hmm. the story and the adventures, but then you, you know, once you start understanding maybe art a little bit yeah. and just the, the, the detail and the 
the running gags and yeah. the you know the recurring characters and just the different things that are just layered throughout you know this comic that he did for 50 years or 40s let's see from 1929 to yeah. 19 uh, eight, until his death yeah. in 1983 so yeah so like 50 some years um, you know it's, it's, it's something that you whether you read the stories once or read them ten times, you can get something else out of them, and they're either quick or very, you know, you can spend an hour and run through a book, or you can spend four or five hours and, and really, really enjoy the yeah. art and, and everything. Um, so that's what we want to do during this uh, show, is to be able to talk about, um, you know, in addition to what, what they mean to us, and just, just sort of get into the nitty-gritty of of the stories and the characters and the um the art and some of the things he was um herge did these again they represent the 20th century basically because he started them um his influence because he was a child grew up during world war one in occupied belgium he during you know, he started the 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 books in 1929, in 1940, Belgium was occupied again, and he was actually working for a, uh, when he started, he was working for a Catholic uh, news, newspaper, and so the comics were done, you know, one day a week, would be two pages or however many panels that would be, and then the next week he would do the next part of the story, so you can see... Um, you know how the layout and the, you know you'd have cliffhangers at the end of you know certain pages because that's the format in a lot of cases um, and then when it came into the 40s and the the uh, in occupied Belgium he he worked for a newspaper that uh, or he, he the newspaper he was working for was shut down but they he went to work for another that was sort of controlled by the occupied forces so he actually got in a little bit of trouble because all he, I mean, he was doing his comic book, and, you know, his, his his comic albums, and his, you know, in the newspapers. But then after the war and the things that he did during that time, it it actually was a shift for him because he really started getting into the more just straight up adventure um, stories and you know, got away from some of the stuff that he did early on, which was more tied to what they wanted him to do for the Catholic newspaper doing the first one is Tintin and Atlanta Soviets where he, uh, where it was more of a propaganda against, uh, against communism, even though the, even though the story is much just straight up adventure story, there's still things in there that were more political than you would see in a lot of his later stuff. Um, so in, in, in the forties he's, he's working for this newspaper and, and just doing straight up adventure stories. But after the war, he, he, you know, he was actually arrested for by four different groups at different times because he was doing this, uh, doing his comic book, you know, for this newspaper that was controlled by by, by the German, you know, occupier. So. Um. And I also think it's interesting. I think not only that he did have this kind of propaganda side, intentionally, unintentionally. I think in a lot of cases he was a, a true believer in some ways, wanted to kind of support the cause in, in certain ways. It was the way of thinking in the country at the time. Um, but it's interesting that it, I know at one point the newspaper he was working for moved away from the two-page format because there was a paper shortage and they started having to do very short panels and just you know one or two strips and it forced him to get a lot more action based increase the gags um, and just get a lot punchier with it and Hergé was also I think really great in that he really was a true artist um, it's interesting to me that his some of his um, cinematic inspirations were Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, and I think you can really see that in the action sequences and the drama that he um, brings in with this clear line art style. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, the logo for Tintin Forever and you see Tintin kind of in this forward motion run, that looks to me right out of a Buster Keaton-like comedy trying to run through the wind. Um, so I, I think that 
Hergé was really trying to look at uh, prominent artists of the time, other comics. He was learning from other comics. I know he was very interested when the speech bubble was being introduced and, and tried to um, incorporate that and figure out how does that work. And I have to say that that is done very well in the Tintin books. In addition to the just expressiveness of the faces, um, I, as I, uh, I was always more drawn to the adventure, the more adventure-based um, comics as opposed to the more kind of propagandized ones that were early on. So for me, The Secret of the Unicorn and Red Rackham's Treasure uh, were uh, very inspirational to me. I think those that's what I would call my favorite, although I do love Tintin and, T and Tibet a lot. <laughs> PG, we're, we're on that one, but my favorite was always Secret of the Unicorn. Maybe it's because I was a girl, and that's the closest thing <laughs> that you get to, be besides Bianca Castafiore. Um, you don't get a lot of women, actually, in the Tintin books. They're in the background, they're the stewardesses, you do have this one big opera singer um, that is a recurring character. But uh, I know they talk a lot about kind of these racial insensitivities, but I think Hergé was not interested in women <laughs> as characters very much, uh, which was kind of interesting. So maybe that's why I latched on to the idea of this unicorn and the treasure hunting uh, of um, those two pieces were, were really great to me. Yeah, I, I realized where I went, went astray. I started talking about... Tintin as as a comic and and you know what it was and then I started I veered off into Hergé but um, so Tintin is is again about this this young reporter who doesn't do that much reporting he um, right. there's a couple you know times in a couple of the books where he pulls out a notepad and takes notes or asks questions in a reporterly fashion but it's mostly about a mystery or something that is happening or pulled he just gets intrigue. pulled into right. you know things find him yes the in, the intrigue finds him more often than him Although, seeking well, it out i don't know sometimes like. i think that tintin he he does have that irascible you know kind of characteristic where he'll go and you know he'll say something isn't right here snowy and and he'll go to that you know gangster hangout <laughs> Go ask the questions. So he does get himself wrangled in with that, that reporter-like curiosity. And a few times they also do have articles written by him that are posted either in the beginning or at the very end. And it's not very often, but it, it does show up occasionally mm -hmm. kind of where Hergé has like a, a little newspaper um, clip and it'll say by Tintin Reporter. The one, the one name wonder. Right. <laughs> Yes, and you mentioned uh, Snowy. He's always accompanied by his uh, by his dog, a little white terrier that uh, always accompanies him. Um, he's one of the, especially in the early ones before mm -hmm. Captain Haddock shows up and sort of steals the spotlight in certain ways uh, in in many of the later books. But uh, Tintin is his you know main companion and and would. You know, break the fourth right. wall, talk to the audience, or talk to himself, which you could, you know, get that conversation uh, of what he's saying. Of course, Tintin doesn't understand right. him. They don't break that that wall. It's it's more about you know just mm -hmm. getting information to us. But a lot of times, you know, t or Tintin may be a little right. uh, naive or not really seeing the evil in people, Snowy's and Snowy it. can sort of see through their. Uh, yeah, Snowy's on it. Uh, of course, he's usually uh, distracted by a bone or, or a chicken or something that, that sort of gets <laughs> him into trouble. Or wine. Or what? <laughs> that, that dog is always getting drunk. Or wine, <laughs> yes. Yes, and um, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny because, um, yeah, like I said, it started out as a... As a as a supplement right. in a, a children's supplement in a, in a Catholic newspaper, but there's very little, oh, yeah. you know, religious, uh, you know, the, you know, Tintin isn't ever, you know, religious. Again, it was more of a, it was a right wing Catholic newspaper, so it was they 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 wanted to do a little more of the politicizing or you know getting across a, a message in certain things, especially again the early on. Almost like a modeling, right? Like a modeling of like how you should mm -hmm. be without the right. religious overtones. Um, 
being forthright and honest yeah, and hardworking. Even Snowy, well, Snowy a couple times will have a have a. I know he has in in like Tintin in the Congo. He says something about David and Goliath and Solomon and different things. So, well, through, that, so yeah. he he has a little bit more knowledge that he'll he'll talk about rather than Tintin. But um, again, the 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 stories. Um, over the years, they they cross, you know, all different genres. Um, you know, you got swashbuckling adventure, especially when they're doing you know things from the from the past where uh, Captain Haddock is talking about his ancestors, and um, you've got uh, you know magical realism, some spiritual things that go on in some of the some of the uh, stories. Um, they go to the moon for gosh sakes. So I mean, science fiction because you know. And the shooting star. Yeah, meteorite yeah. Uh, is the center of a, a story. A lot of drug trafficking. The drug, the drug trafficking yes, thing is huge. Uh, that that shows up in a lot. Yes, uh, communists are bad. Yeah, that's a pretty consistent. Um, one. Yeah. Let's see. Americans uh, took advantage of the American Indian, and um, yes. Al Capone's a bad guy, which I guess was true in in, in those cases. But he, they played yeah. that up very well. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, over time, though, the adventure aspect. Well, for example, Tintin and Soviets. Um, you know, it said that he. He basically based his understanding and viewpoint and what he represented in his book from one sort of historical pamphlet book that he had access to and didn't really have a whole lot of information uh, to go on when he was writing his first story. And um, as time went on and as he became more of a master of his art form and... Um, of the story, he also became very, um, very focused on being as realistic as possible when it came to places and people and you know locations and cars and rocket ships and whatever he was working on. He, you know, researched and did you know a wonderful job of. Um, one of the things that you were talking about, the art style, um, it's called, and I, I do not, I'll have to ask you for all the French pronunciation. Ligne claire. Yes, so <laughs> ligne claire, which is uh, clear lines. Uh, one of the, um, one of the attributes of this or, or is that you have somewhat, you might have cartoonish characters, um, you know, like Tintin has these, ultra skinny lower legs that that you know sort of if if he is wearing things that show his legs his legs don't look quite in proportion to to the rest of his body and and other characters might look a little little off but like the surroundings and the backgrounds and the and the vehicles are just just very you know um you know meticulously drawn and realistic and that's sort of when you look at a lot of the um european comics from you know after uh herge um you see this in a lot of, of of those as well that style um a little bit more about that is that it's um again it's called clear lines there's lines um that are um on the edges of most things um there there's not that much in the in his first couple comics there's a, there's more hatching that he does where you know you use the the crossing lines to build shadow and maybe get, provide depth uh with with this method there's a lot of flat looking um because it's it's there it's again lines and then solid colors within the different uh uh pieces of art and hopefully I'll be throwing up some images here so people can see what I'm talking about. Um, and the, uh, uh, but the use of the, of the solid colors can add depth to, um, to the, to the image. And again, the, the intricacies of the backgrounds and what's going on around again, adds, adds just as much depth as in, uh, as with some of the different styles that may have done different things with shadows to add, uh, add depth. Um, well, and it's interesting also that, that those were all black and white originally. Mm -hmm. 
and that the color, especially for the early ones, was not added until later when Hergé had some, some kind of time on his hands and had his own studio, then one of the things he did is to go back and, um, and colorize those early ones. So he really did have to rely on the crosshatching and everything else to provide some of the depth. And then later, I think it is beautiful work with color. Um, there's kind of a very muted, realistic uh, quality to the color selection, to the color palette. Uh, even when they are a little more spiritual or, you know, kind of far out there mysticism going on, uh, or they're going to the moon or what have you, the color palette allows you to go into that world in a really amazing way. Um, it doesn't seem garish, it doesn't seem... The, the color allows you as the reader to make you think this is real. This I, I could really this could really happen. There really could be a curse on seven scientists and they could all go into this kind of strange, you know, weird slumber that they have. Um, uh, so I, I really do appreciate it from an artistic level uh, how he was able to communicate the world through his color selection and color palette. Right, and there's a uh, like you said his color palette changes depending on where in the world he is. You know, if you right. look at, you know, Prisoners of the Sun or the, the um, uh, what's the Incan one? What's, uh, oh, Prisoners, Prisoners, of, Prisoners of, the of the Sun and the oh, Cigars of the Pharaoh and things like that. You know, did oh, yeah. the, the different color palettes for that. And then you've got, um, you know the Black Tintin Island has a different one. Yeah, yeah, you know different different places, and of course Tintin and Tibet's a blue lot Lotus. of white and blue and different things. So, um, yeah, there's there's a use of color, and again, like you said, um, did a lot of his work in black and white, or you know in the newspapers with black and white. But when they right. collected the albums, uh, the first few were still black and white when they collected the albums. Uh, and then in some cases, like with the um, uh, Tintin in the Congo and um, Tintin in America. They he actually went back, you know, maybe I don't know how many years later, but redid a lot of those early, uh, the early ones to sort of right. bring them up to date with his artistic style that he that he uh, developed over the years to make it a little more uh, modern, not modern, but just mm -hmm. you know catch it up so that some of the um, some of his learnings of his of his youth, as far as his artistic talent. Yeah, maybe make, talent. just make it more consistent. Right. right. Um, he didn't but, screw it up um, the way George Lucas screwed up Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's not the not kind of modernizing we're topic. talking. <laughs> not, that's not the modernizing we're talking about. Yeah, he, um, <laughs> one of the things that I talked a little bit about is that you know during World War World War One, uh, when he was growing up, uh, he lived in occupied Belgium and one of the probably the one of the big influences of his life is that he became a Boy Scout uh, he uh, at one point and um, this is after World War one but he with his Boy Scout troops that he was with he they traveled uh, hiked 200 miles across the Pyrenees um, right. you know the the being a Boy Scout sort of um, defined a lot of his um, moral compass and his uh, you know always keep your promises uh, which would come up later in his life and just love of the natural world that you can see in all of his all of his uh, stories um, he, before he did Tintin he did a uh, a series of um, for a Boy Scout magazine uh, which is called the um, the adventures of uh, Totor um, which I think they say the represent or the character that looks a lot like Tintin was inspired by his brother, uh, so some of that sort of carried over into Tintin. He liked that alliteration, so Tortor and Tintin. Um, in 1926, he was he did a brief stint as a teacher, as in he taught one class and then quit. Uh, joined the <laughs> military. He was teaching an art class, and and I think he did it for one day. They said and. And didn't like it at all. Hated it. Um, he served in the Belgian military, and um, after that, he would he was able or he wanted to get a job at that at the newspaper that he actually got a job at later. They didn't have room for him or didn't he was too young at the time, so he he went into the military, um, did some things there as far as uh, uh, 
working on his craft as an artist, uh, came back and they found a job for him um, at that Catholic newspaper. And do you, can you say the name of it? Uh, <laughs> Le Ventillon Cyclé. Uh, Cyclé. Le Ventillon Cyclé. So basically called the 20th Century, translated. Um, and eventually he's put in charge of uh, the children's section, which I think was every Thursday. Le yes, the, the, the little 20th for the, the kids section. Uh, and that's when you know, you're trying to figure out what to do with this section. And so he wanted to do, he was, came up with the idea of Tintin, wanted to do Tintin in America because he was all, that was one of his fascinations was, was the United States. Uh, but the the guy who ran the the newspaper, uh, Father, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, da, 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 Norbert Wallace um, wanted him to do again the Tintin in the land of Soviets because uh, he want they wanted to have something that would speak out against uh, communism, um, and so that was the the first story from there and. Uh, um, we will talk a lot more about this our ne our episode and again um what we'll be doing is uh one show a month we'll probably record actually our first episode i'm calling this episode zero uh where we're just yapping and but the first episode we'll probably record in the next week or two and release that in the middle of october um and if thereafter we'll we'll record and try to try to release uh an episode the first thursday of every month after that so we'll uh, uh, do a book for each one so we won't get too much into uh, Tintin and the Land of the Soviets we'll save that for our first episode but um, it actually wasn't released um, after it was written it wasn't collected and released or it may have been released as a book right away but then it was never re-released it wasn't colorized uh, and you couldn't get it he finally agreed to release it in the I think the 1970s because uh, you know, people were, were pirating or, or, you know, had their own versions that they were releasing and, uh, um, you know, selling them for hundreds of dollars because, you know, it, it, the, the real, the real work wasn't, wasn't available anywhere. So, um, so he finally brought it back out. But, um, um, I, I was really fascinated by the fact that it was, you know, in learning that Tintin was popular really quite quickly to the point that you know the first one's coming out in 1929 something by like 1936 they're already merchandising Tintin and this was not like the typical Disney machine where as soon as you release anything you have like 50 billion products with that new character's face on it you know right. I mean, merchandising was a, still a little new um, and so you know there really must have been quite you know the at least in the Euro European community, they were really very taken with Tintin um, from an early point, and it was awesome. Yeah, so the yeah, I mean, it was very popular, and you know, you had things going on in America as far as comic strips becoming popular. But even though it was a smaller, you know, Brussels, Belgium, not only so many people. I mean, at right. the end of this first book, it was almost like this. It was a fictional st story that was going on, but people were taking it. Seriously, to the point mm. where in the, at the end of the publication, again, it took a year or however long to finish the entire the story cereal, in right. the newspaper because it was serialized in the newspaper. They had a homecoming for Tintin, you know, matching the end of the story. And they had, you know, had uh, one of Hergé's friends dress up as Tintin, had a, had a, you know, a terrier and came on, on the train and there was like 5,000 people that came to yeah. uh, you know welcome him home from the land of the Soviets and and you know obviously something like that wouldn't happen today in the internet world or what have you but you have this this community this city this this country that is following along and and you know the the um, subscriptions to this newspaper just skyrocket and you know halfway through this 
story because people, you know, are starting to hear about it and learn about it. And then right. not that they really took it seriously as far as this was a real story, but they just bought into the whole idea of, you know, this is this is cool. We got this guy that's going to be coming back to <laughs> coming back to Brussels. Let's go see him at the train station. And they have a big event, well, and they they do it. At, they did it at the end of the second book, which is the the Congo, um, right. and had you know uh, zoo animals at the train station, and you know um, again even more people show up. So it was it was a um, an event, it, you know, it was a whatever you would call it, a fad or what have you. But it was it was right. immediately popular and just gained in popularity, you know, for, right from the beginning. Um, you know, it never never really waned at all. Mm -hmm. um, and RJ did other, you know, little comics through his career, uh, not just at the beginning, but he there were little forays into other characters and other comic strips that to you know, varying extent. I mean, sometimes they would have five albums. I think that was the most I am aware of. But, um, you know, it was really Tintin that that caught everyone's imagination and allowed Hergé to be uh, the artist that he was and for that to really be the way that he made his money, um, to even open studios that, that were just dedicated to the production of this very popular comic you know, so he, he did do other things, but none of them caught on the same way that, that Tintin did. Not even close, in my, you know, right. from what I understand about it. You know, during World War II, they, you know, the magazine, he changed to a different magazine and then uh, had our newspaper and, you know, with the paper shortage, changed, you know, the style, it became much more of an adventure type stories. Um, and then after World War II, he he was actually banned from working for newspapers because of, again working for a uh, a newspaper during the war uh, that was you know controlled by German forces. So he pretty much he almost moved to Argentina at one time, but decided to stick it out. And then somebody opened uh, basically a, a magazine directly for him to do this. Uh, do his Tintin, Tintin magazine. Tintin. Yes, Tintin magazine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then, um, you know, throughout the second half of his life, you know, he did some amazing things with, you know, I mean, just just the whole idea of before the space program even really started. He does mm -hmm. he does a, two books on going to the moon. Um, so he was, you know, some of some of his stories are just just. You know, cross all these genres and and get into uh, into things that just you know appealed to everybody at the time and then continue to to appeal to to readers today. And now I did want to share the story of of um, yeah the re the reason the reason that I found out that Valerie was such a big fan was her, and her husband and son were coming through Charlotte and uh, I. Um, was meeting them to have breakfast with them as they were coming through town, and I wanted to, to you know, bring their son something and and uh, you know have in 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 telling the story about my aunt bringing you know these books to me that there were some that she she you know doubled up and bought me another copy of them so I had one that I I brought uh, a a a second copy to to uh, James and Valerie's son. And the first thing he says, "Oh yeah, I already got this. I've read all these," <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I learned that uh, that that Valerie was a big fan, and uh, we we talked about that, and that's what started this whole thing was was mm -hmm. um, you know doing that with her son, and I'm hoping that uh, one of the things we'll do with this with this show and 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 podcast is that uh, you know maybe get her. Get uh, get your son on here. He's a he's a ball of fire, and talk about why he loves Tintin. Maybe some of the if there's one that is, is his favorite, we can get him on to to talk about. Definitely. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, because the whole idea of this is that um, calling it Tintin Forever is you know because we think it's it's something that that is timeless, um, it, even though it is a. Um, Again, a look at the 20th century. It was the time that, that you know it was written. Was the time that, that you know it was a turbulent century as far as everything that was going on, and 
you know, even though it does um, tie back to, to that in a lot of ways. When you read them, um, it's something that, that is, is timeless. You know, you can, you, you can get something out of it no matter how old you are or how, how old the story is. It's, it's uh, something, the humor in it and um, yeah. the, the, the adventure of it is uh, something that, that transcend, transcends time. So, um, I agree. And the characters are so well drawn, they just become your friends. I think that's part of it, too, and that adds to the timeless factor. Yeah, we haven't talked a lot about the characters. Um, I mean, we talked about Snowy, though, and Captain Haddock, who becomes uh, sort of his partner in in his adventures um, after they meet in, uh, it's like Crab with the Golden Claws, I think, uh-huh. is where they where they meet and uh some of some of the stories you know center around captain haddock and if you watch the tintin movie they pulled some of that uh some of those plots from different books into that movie um and then after this uh sort of marlon spike hall becomes their uh their their yeah, center their base, of operations yeah. yeah their home base and uh, so there's some adventures that take place some you know some of the story might be in Marlin Spike Hall before they go away and there's you know Nestor the butler and uh <laughs> the uh, the to- you know Thompson and Thompson which I still don't understand why Thompson and Thompson one was is with a p and one is with <laughs> It. Not that's a pee. That's what makes it great. That's because it's PG. great. That's what makes that's it great. That's what makes it great. <laughs> so we have these two inspectors. I, you know, you, you again, you're reading it from a, the English translation. It, it seems like they work for Scotland Yard or, right. or you know, work for that. But I, I don't know in the French, Belgian, They're, yeah, you know, the original what what who they worked for. But you know, they're basically the police. But they're you know the the comic relief in a lot of ways not that most of the characters are comic relief in some way but they're they're as bumbling as as possible but and we you know, can Tintin all relate seen, to bumbling police we can all relate to bumbling police relate i think that. that's yes. why it works <laughs> <laughs> well somehow tintin always makes them look good by the end of the yeah, end of the story and never takes credit and you know but um yeah they're two of my definitely two of my favorite characters uh, as, as, well. as they are yours uh, but I mean, one one of the things that that Hergé does is um, he has recurring characters. Uh, he so again took that from uh, from different things from from in some. Uh, I think they, he was a fan of Balzac and the mm-hmm. the um, human comedy. The uh, had several stories with the same villain, um, and so. Um, you know, he brought that into his his work in some ways with uh, you know R- Roberto was it R- Rastapopoulos R- oh, yes. <laughs> Rastapopoulos and uh, General Alcazar mm-hmm. and uh, you know some of the some of the villains that that make more than just one appearance uh, in the stories and you mentioned uh, uh, Bianca Castiglione and um, you know so that that uh, who's a villain in her um, own way. Yes. <laughs> At least Captain yes. Haddock thinks so. Yeah, and I was my personal, say, yeah. actually, I love Thompson and Thompson, but my, but my favorite probably is Cuthbert Calculus. I love. He is a a almost deaf scientist inventor that they meet in um, Secret of the Unicorn or Red uh, the one after Red Rackham's Treasure, and um, he be, just kind of comes into the family, comes into the fold. Captain Haddock has both a, has a love hate relationship with this poor old. <laughs> little man this little scientist who's both a genius and just a complete buffoon in some ways um but does great things he's the one who designs the rocket that takes them to the moon and he kind of comes through for them on a regular basis with his amazing adventures and scientific perceptions and but his way of getting there is one of the delightful gags that kind of runs through the entire series let alone one particular book but the the just fun that they get to have with word play because he's hard of hearing and captain haddock is so annoyed by that and tintin's trying to help him understand in a very sincere way leads to a whole series of jokes that just in de- make him even more endearing uh, so he's he's just absolutely one of my favorite characters and that is, you know, one of the things that 
again, talking about the, um, the translation of Tintin, a lot of the characterization and the, the, the humor is on, based on wordplay and yeah. based on, you know, uh, Captain Haddock swears not in you know using words you know that we would normally consider right. swearing but his 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 yelling and screaming at at you know everything that happens to him and and that the translating from 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 French and Belgium into into into, right. into English he had two English translators that did a lot of worked with him closely for you know 30 40 years on these things and you know the word play like you're talking about uh Calculus being half deaf and half deaf, and Captain Haddock always getting frustrated with him, not you know not being understood, and um, you know just the, the there's a lot of things in there. Just the fact that they're able to uh, translate all of that into English and make the jokes work as well as they do. Um, is pretty amazing. So. Well, I think it's great that they didn't rely on literal translation. They really went for the character development so that you have 10,000 thundering typhoons. That's, that's great in English. It's not what it is in French. And actually, it'd be uh, when I was growing up, my my cousins were also huge fans of Tintin. I didn't know that until I was out visiting them out west. And their uh, mother was Finnish, and their father was a linguist. So I would go in there with my little English translations of Tintin, and they would be reading them in Finnish, in French, in German, <laughs> in, in Spanish, in Portuguese. Like, you know, just interchangeably. So at the time, I was just awfully, like, put out by that because they were just so smart. And um, <laughs> But it would be interesting now, as an adult, a little more confident, to go back and find out, you know, as they were reading different versions, you know, what, how was the Portuguese version different from the Finnish version? Diff and how did those jokes work? And how were the names different in the different wordplay? Um, so I'm have to call up one of my cousins and get a little inside scoop on, on how that whole thing worked from a reader's perspective. That's very cool. <laughs> yep. Uh, one of the things that, that happened um, in Hergé's life in 1930s, he met a young Chinese art student mm. uh, named Chang, uh, who ended up being in um, The Blue Lotus and then Tintin in Tibet, uh, which was 40 year, written 40 years later, I think. Um, and um, that was sort of his first, The Blue Lotus was the first time that he really took seriously the idea of, I'm writing about um, a place and I need to really understand what you know what this place is and how the people are and you know really you know that 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 was sort of a turning point for him I think with you know, representing a culture and a people and a location uh, in a way even though there's still some uh, let's say, generalizations of, of, you know, the Japanese, as I'm thinking as Japanese, or Japanese or Chinese, like soldiers, uh, being sort of mocked uh, in the story, but still the whole idea of representing the culture and the people that, that, he's, that Tintin's basically trying to help because of... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Some of those drug things we were talking about. <laughs> the opium den. <laughs> the opium dens and such. So, uh, But that is sort of a turning point in, in how uh, some of his research and, uh, you know, from meeting this, this person who, uh, this Chinese uh, man who was, you know, describing the art and the culture of where he grew up. And, he, and you know, Hergé took that to heart as far as um, representing that in the story. Right. And he seemed to be... Uh, fascinated with uh, with uh, Arabia and mm. Arab cultures, he does a lot of stories uh, set in that uh, place. And of course, talked about you know South America and uh, you know. So he he wasn't much of a world traveler. He, he used Tintin to travel the world, and again, like we said, even go to the moon. Yeah. Uh, but 
you know, he, he, he did a really good job of representing, you know, of course, a, a caricature right. in, in a lot of ways of, of certain places, but it, uh, getting a lot of, uh, of, of facts right and, and the, the, you know, the, um, the locations and the geography and, and, and the different things in these places, uh, very, very well done. Um, and when he in Tintin in Tibet, there was you know, he did a um, basically a story about about uh, spirituality in a way because he we talked about Chang Tintin feels that uh, Chang is he supposedly died in a plane crash, but he just has this feeling that it, that that he's alive, and so the story is him doing you know trying to find him, and uh, you know comes to a to a. Uh, I guess a Buddhist monastery at one point, and um, you know, after after Herge's death, uh, the Dalai Lama gave gave her gave Tintin a, an award for for you know representing um, you know representing the the faith and the spirituality of, of you know the the Eastern world in a, in such a positive way in in in, in the story. So it was uh, uh, one of those things that that. I didn't understand any of it really when it came to just reading it as an adventure story, but it still it got through to me because uh, it was again one of probably my favorite overall story. Plus, it has you know a yeti, so you can't <laughs> go know. wrong with a yeti. <laughs> <laughs> Always a little bit. So of as you can as you can tell, we are very excited about doing this, and uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. Um, I hope that, um, you know, if you are a fan, you'll be able to get something out of this. If you don't know a lot about Tindon, maybe you saw the movie and had no idea that there was even, you know, more story here that it was, you know, cause the movie positive or negative, it was a good adventure story, but there was, it left a lot on the table as far as, uh, Getting you to understand, there's a whole lot more to this world than than when, what was in the movie, and um, so if you aren't familiar with with the actual comic albums and what we would call graphic novels now, hopefully you'll you'll come back and join us in the future to hear us talk about it and uh, learn more about Hergé as we go along, because uh, he was <laughs> a very interesting uh, man and lived a. a a wonderfully diverse life, even though for 50, 60, however long of his life he was doing this, this store, this Tintin, you know, books. Uh, but his life was, was, um, had a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we can sort of dive into, um, you know, while we're discussing what was going on during the, the writings of these books. And, uh, um, you know, we're going to have some fun with that. So, um, Valerie, PG. is there anything you else wanted to say before we no. sign off no, for the evening? No, but I'm very excited. I'm off, to ha I'm off to read one right now, and I'll get my toast buttered and get my little hot go. chocolate Yeah, I want, I want hot chocolate. <laughs> so next time, what we're going to be doing, again, we're going to probably record in a week or so and hopefully get... Uh, um, yeah, one of the things I didn't really talk about is that I'm I'm treating this differently than our other podcasts and YouTube shows, um, which is why I'm not looking at the webcam right now. Um, I'm hoping to you know have our recordings here, edit them, drop in some images from the comics and different things, and uh, we're gonna steal some music from from James. We'll put him to work and. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, give it a little bit more of a produ production feel and, and uh, produce show and uh, make it something that uh, we can all be proud of and uh, maybe last and bring it to, to people in the future because we're going to have some fun the next time we are going to be talking about uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets um, reporter for La, La Petit <laughs> what is it uh, le petit uh, vontiem. 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 Okay, <laughs> now, I, now I know. I can, I can say it next time. Um, so Tintin in the Land of Soviets, we'll talk about that story and about uh, the, the time when it was written, go into more detail about that. And um, 
um, we look forward to doing that and uh, um, we do have uh, some ways to contact us the other reason I hope you can get some audience participation in the future once we really get into this because again the way we're doing this will be doing an episode on each book um, if you want to you know we'll be recording probably two weeks after the the previous episode comes out so there'll be a couple weeks there where if anybody wants to ask questions um, we'll, we'll pull them into the show as far as you know trying to answer any questions people might have um, there are different ways to get a hold of us um, you can email us at uh, tintin that's t-i-n-t-i-n at specficmedia.com uh, we have a voicemail line, so if you do have questions or comments, we'll uh, play them during the show. And uh, that number is 704-981-1736. And all this information will be on the, uh, on the website over at specficmedia.com. Um, and you can post questions or comments here on when we release the show on YouTube. Uh, there's also be a, a place on specficmedia.com where you could leave questions as well. So gather those before we record, and uh, we'll probably there'll be a post on uh, specficmedia.com for each time, so you'll know exactly when we're recording. So if you have questions or want to leave a voicemail, you can do that. No, you know you'll get it to us before we record. So uh, we will see you next time on Tintin Forever. Forever. Thanks, everybody.